welcome to the Art of the Muppets here at the Children's Museum. I'm Kermit the Frog, host of the Muppet Show, and your guide on today's tour. You'll be seeing and meeting a lot of your old friends today, and some you may not know. You'll also be finding out a lot about what makes us tick. By now, you've probably already noticed the huge seven-foot-tall creature ahead of you. That's Junior Gorg. He's a very lovable character from our television show, Fraggle Rock. Take a good look at Junior Gorg from the front, and then walk around him. Now you can see that although he looks complete from the front, from the back you can actually look directly into him and see how he works and what he's made of. That mannequin inside the gourd is a model of Rob Mills, the performer or puppeteer who controls the movement of the gourd's body. The gourd is attached to the puppeteer's shoulders. Notice the little black cord that goes from the puppeteer's eyepiece out through the front of the gourd's head. The cord is part of the fiber optic controls that let the puppeteer see what he's doing and what's going on around him. There are other electronic or radio operated controls in Junior Gorg's head. They're operated by a second performer, Richard Hunt, who stays outside the Gorg. He operates Junior Gorg's mouth and eyes by a remote control and is responsible for his voice and characterization. The construction is quite complicated. It's aimed at making the character as light as possible. Notice how the fur has been applied the same way you'd hook a rug. This enables more air to get to the performer inside. Junior Gorg is being used to open this show for a number of reasons. Of course, he's a full and lovable character in his own right, but he's also a great example of the aim of this exhibit. To give you the chance to see some of what goes on behind the scenes with us Muppets, how we're made, how we move, and how the amazing things we do get done. Junior Gorg is a combination of sophisticated modern technology and the age-old art of puppetry. Before we move on, let me remind you to turn off your acoustic guide whenever you want to spend more time looking at something or when you hear this signal. For that means our next stop is more than a few steps away. Now let's look at the Fraggle Rock display. It's behind Junior along the wall. In the case at the center of the mural are the five main Fraggles for whom Fraggle Rock is named. They are Gobo, Red, Wembley, Uber, and Moki. The Fraggles are furry, fun-loving creatures who believe a good week's work should be about a half hour long. The rest is for swimming, singing, eating, and play. Behind them is a mural which shows both Fraggles and Gorgs. It helps give you an idea of their relative sizes. Fraggle Rock is co-produced by Henson Associates and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and it's actually taped in Toronto. In this country, it's on home box office. The program premiered in January 1983 and represents another new departure for the Muppets. It's an international show designed for audiences around the world with its own group of characters. Unlike the Muppet Show, which is a variety show, on Fraggle Rock, each show has its own story and theme. The program is for family viewing. It's an entertaining show which deals mostly with the serious problems of growing up or taking responsibility for your own actions. There are three groups of characters on Fraggle Rock, the furry Fraggles, the giant Gorgs, and the Doozers. These different groups and characters must learn how to live together. Continuing to your right, you'll see the tiny ant-like Doozers. Now, Doozers are very industrious and hard-working characters. There are buttons on three sides of this case. You can push them and see the Doozers in action. In the show, these Doozers are operated by remote control. This is because they're only about seven inches high. In order to get the intricate movements we're trying for, we have to use remote control because a puppeteer couldn't possibly get his or her hand inside a doozer. This is the first time we've developed characters who are operated totally by remote control. We don't like to overdo the mechanicals, but in this case, we had no choice. We usually try to keep a Muppet's performance as spontaneous as possible. 
For example, instead of actually doing a rehearsal for a program like The Muppet Show, all the performers just read through the script together and they go out and do it. So there's a lot of ad-libbing in the actual performance. Looking to your right, you'll see a familiar green hand pointing down the hall. Follow that hand and straight ahead of you as you enter, you'll see Sam and Friends. Sam and Friends was the first Muppet program, beginning in 1954. The term Muppet was made up about 30 years ago by Jim Henson, my alter ego. TV was still pretty new then, and Jim was fascinated by its possibilities, and especially by all the things you could do with puppets on TV. In those days, Sam and Friends appeared as a local five-minute-long late-night adult show, which aired just before The Tonight Show. The puppets were built and performed by Jim and Jane Henson. You can see Jim and Jane in the photo mural. So here you see the veteran Muppets, including Sam, the main character, and his friends Yorick, Moldy Hay, and Harry. Oh, and there was another narrator, a sort of lizardy thing named Kermit. Yep, I was one of the first Muppets, the only one who's still around. Thirty years is a long time for a frog. Sam and friends were simple creatures. We specialized in pantomimes of popular songs and in comedy sketches. The success of the program led to appearances on network television. Muppets were frequent guests on The Tonight Show, Ed Sullivan Show, The Dick Cavett Show, The Jimmy Dean Show, and lots of others. At the end of this wall, you'll find the road box. We call it that because it's similar to the boxes we Muppets travel in out here on the road. The road box shows some of the people most responsible for the Sesame Street Muppet characters. Now, just around this wall is the videotape presentation showing segments of Sam and Friends. You'll also be able to see scenes of Sesame Street as it is now produced in six different languages. We Muppets have become very international. Behind you, in a case by himself, is someone I'm sure you'll recognize. It's Big Bird, of course. Carol Spinney is the man who performs Big Bird. He's performed Big Bird since the show's beginning and is most responsible for his gentle, loving, and childlike nature. Big Bird was recently the star of the first full-length Sesame Street movie, Follow That Bird. Across the room opposite Big Bird, you'll find display cases containing some other familiar faces. To the left are Grover, Sherlock Hemlock, Oscar the Grouch, and a tan anything Muppet. Anything Muppets are just what they sound like. Simple, basic shapes with features like eyes, ears, and hair that can be changed. That lets them play many roles, from bus driver to country singer. In the case on your right, you'll see Bert and Ernie, the Cookie Monster, and the Count. Ernie is performed by Jim Henson, who also has quite a bit to do with what I say and do. Bert, Rover, and Cookie Monster are all performed by Frank Oz, who incidentally also does Miss Piggy. Jerry Nelson performs The Count. Sesame Street is produced by the Children's Television Workshop. Jim Henson worked closely with the people at CTW, developing these characters especially for the show, which had its first season back in 1969. We Muppets got our first regular place on public TV, and Jim and his company Henson Associates are still involved today. Segments that involve characters like Bert and Ernie are taped as groups of scenes, or what we call inserts. A group of inserts will be taped at the same time. These are then banked, or held, until they're needed for a particular show. Of course, some Muppets, like Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch, appear regularly with the human actors on Sesame Street. When you're ready, let's walk to your right, where you'll see a scale model of me riding my bicycle. Maybe you wondered how I do it. Well, as you can see, the model is split. One side shows how close-up shots are done with the puppeteers pulled along on dollies, and the other side shows how wide shots are done. Those people on the crane are supporting the bike with strings, while my head is worked by radio control. 
Jim Henson explains this in detail on the videotape here. The tape also shows scenes from Emmett Otter, where we'll be going next after you have a chance to watch the videotape. Ever since the Muppet movie premiered, people have been asking me how the Muppets ride bicycles. Well, here's Kermit. He's a marionette here. That's a puppet that's worked on strings from above. And the marionettist is riding in a crane high overhead. Now, we would intercut this shot with a shot of a hand puppet version of Kermit. Now, when we needed to show a whole group of characters, we just tied all the bicycles together with rods. Then we could radio control the mouths of the characters and pull the whole thing along with strings. The whole rig is being pulled from in front by two big tricycles. You have to look close because they're way down the road there, but one of those is being ridden by my son, Brian. Now let's walk across the way to the case with Emmett and his mother in a rowboat. As you may know, Emmett Otter and his mother are characters from Emmett Otter's Junk Band Christmas, a television special first produced in 1976 and aired in 1977. The show is often rebroadcast at Christmas time. You can push a button in the front of the case to make the oars move and see what it actually looked like as Emmett and his mother rode. Like my bike, this boat was operated by radio control. On the shelf above Emmett and his ma are some of Emmett's friends and neighbors living along the riverbank. There's Mr. and Mrs. Possum, Wendell Porcupine, Hetty Muskrat, and Doc Bullfrog. These characters are very different from many other Muppets you're familiar with. They're not strange monsters or creatures you've never seen before. They're more like real animals. By the way, if you haven't seen the show, it's a wonderful story based on a book about how Emmett and his friends, who are very poor, managed to celebrate the Christmas spirit. To the left, in the other case, are the show's villains, the River Bottom Nightmare Gang. These characters are less realistic and more Muppety than Emmett and his friends. A lot of detail went into making these characters. For example, little dabs of hot glue placed in circles from a hot glue gun give Howard Snake and Fred Lizard their scaly effect. A special paint rubbed over them makes them glisten. Catfish is made of foam carved so it looks scaly, and sequins have been sewn to the scales. Much care went into their construction and the clothes they wear. They all wear specially designed shoes, many of which were cast in latex rubber. When you're ready, let's go into the next room where you'll find me, Kermit the Frog, and our leading lady, Miss Piggy. I'm sitting in my director's chair, a pretty dapper frog, don't you think? To your right, you'll find Miss Piggy and the rest of the Muppet gang. She's wearing a gorgeous hand-beaded gown which she felt would fit this occasion. Doesn't she look terrific? Behind Miss Piggy is the Manhattan skyline. It's an actual set piece from our film, The Muppets Take Manhattan. The movie takes place in Manhattan where we Muppets, led by me, a very green playwright, are trying to take our show to Broadway. The film was released in the summer of 84. In the case to the right of Miss Piggy, you'll probably recognize Fozzie Bear, Gonzo the Great, and Camilla, Scooter, and Ralph. In the case to the left of Miss Piggy, you'll see Janice, Floyd, and Animal from the Muppet Mayhem Band. Swedish Chef, and the Rats, who, by the way, have a big role in the movie. Around to your left is a videotape which takes you behind the scenes. Here you can see the performers or puppeteers work with us. There are scenes from the Muppets Take Manhattan, too. You might want to turn off your machine and watch the videotape for a while. My name is Jim Henson, and I've been doing the Muppets for over 25 years. And actually, I've been working Kermit the Frog for almost that long. The Muppet Show is now seen in over 100 countries, and I'm just delighted with the show's success. Because until this program came along, no one had ever done a show quite like this, where the real stars are puppets. We want you. We want you. We want you as a new recruit. We want you. We want you. We want you as a new recruit. We want you! We want 
you, we want you as a new recruit. We want you, we want you, we want you as a new recruit. Where can you find pleasure? Search the world for treasure. Learn science, technology. Where? Where can you begin to make your dreams all come true? On the land or on the sea? Where? We want you, we want you as a new recruit. We want you, we want you, we want you as a new recruit. Seven seas in the Navy. Yes, you can put your mind at ease in the Navy. Come on now, people, make a stand in the Navy. Our entire reality is on the screen. You are performing, and at the same time, you're seeing your performance exactly like the audience does. Until we had television puppetry, it wasn't possible. You'll notice when we're working out on the floor, we have monitors all around the place. Because everybody has to see a monitor. Ooh! Terrible! Bad! Not bad! Oh, pretty good! Okay! Decent! Fair! Great! I loved it! Go on, go on. To your left, you'll see the Muppet Babies from the Muppet Thick Manhattan. They are also the stars of their own MTV Rock video and can be seen in animated form Saturday mornings on CBS in The Muppet Babies. When you're finished here, meet me at the touch wall, across the gallery to your left. The touch wall is there to touch. Please remember that a lot of people will be wanting to touch this wall too, so please be gentle. It's a collage of people, processes, and materials that go into the makeup of the Muppets. While you look and touch, let me tell you a little about creating a Muppet. First, to the right up on the top, you can see Jim Henson discussing an idea with our art director, Michael Frith. Then it's put into sketch form. You can see Michael sketching. The sketch then goes to a puppet designer and builder who fleshes it out into three-dimensional form. The designer works with a block of foam, carve, snip, or pattern. Then other people figure out how the puppet is going to work, what it's going to wear, and what the finished look will be. At the end of this process, we put the puppet in the hands of a performer. A lot of people help shape one Muppet's personality. Directly across from the touch wall is Pigs in Space. These are life-size cutouts of performers against the studio background. Each one is holding a character from the Muppet Show's Pigs in Space segment. Three of the four main kinds of puppets that we work with are shown here. To the far right are Jim Henson and Kathy Mullen, who are working Captain Link Hogthrop. He's a live hand puppet. Jim uses one hand to work Link's mouth and head. The other is actually inside Link's left hand, which is sort of a glove. Kathy is working Link's right hand. To the left of Jim and Kathy is Frank Odds. He's holding a hand and rod puppet. A wire rod extends from the puppet's hand, which is how the puppeteer works the hand. Second from the left is Rizzo the Rat, worked by Steve Whitmire. Rizzo is a rod puppet. The fourth kind of puppet is one in which the performer is actually inside the puppet, like Junior Gorg or Big Bird. This is described in greater detail on the road box at the end of this wall. 
Next to the road box, you'll see some behind-the-scenes photos of performers in action. show here you can't treat me like that i'll stick my pet barracuda on you get her kevin okay vets hospital on stage in one minute good written suit snout tell me kevin is it always like this on the show oh how do you mean well, all this craziness oh well this is actually a rather quiet show for us no unforeseen disasters so far hurry up get okay. out all right all right, all right. All right. Yeah! Unforeseen disasters? Uh, uh, well, that's a disaster we knew about all along. <laughs> Frank Oz joined me about 18 years ago, so I think I've often credited him with being one of the real reasons that The Muppet Show is funny. And of course, most people know him on the show as the man behind Miss Piggy. Is the pig ready? The pig takes twice as long as the guest stars. <laughs> Okay, Just the... the sofa goes across. All right. Yeah. Bye, Frank. The necessity of uh, doing a shot like this, you have to, uh, you have to, uh, in order to make it look good up there, it has to be uncomfortable down here. Four weeks you rehearse and rehearse. Three weeks and it couldn't be worse. your fingers and hold your heart it's curtain time and the way we go another opening of another opening of another show now let's go to the end of the room where you'll find a moonscape in the video studio Video studio, that's fun to say. It's set up to give you a chance at working with a puppet, just the way the performers do when they're taping a TV show. Before you give it a try yourself, why don't you watch what's going on from this side while I tell you a little bit about what to expect. Performers usually have to hold Muppets high above their heads, keeping their heads below the set or stage floor. Instead of looking up at their hands to see what's going on, they look down at a monitor. That's a TV screen which shows the puppeteer what the TV camera sees. What really makes it tough is that the monitor shows everything in reverse. To move the puppet to screen left, you have to move him to your right. That sounds tricky and it is. Each puppeteer has to operate the puppet, watch the monitor, make the puppet's mouth, body and voice all work together, and avoid getting tangled in the microphone cord or having puppets bump into each other by mistake. It's a complicated job and it takes a long time to become good at it. Why don't you give it a try yourself? When you're ready, I'll meet you in the next room at Saturday Night Live. Here are the characters from Saturday Night Live. They were created in 1975 for the first season of Saturday Night Live, the NBC comedy show. This group is unlike any Muppets that came before them. They're fairly elaborate compared to a simple guy like me. Their eyes are different too. Real glass eyes gotten from a taxidermist not so-called cartoon eyes like mine. Even though these creatures are pretty unrealistic, weird and mossy, their eyes make them look real. Bet you've never seen characters like these in your backyard or in the local park or even a zoo. They're residents of the land of Gorch, which extends from the rotting forest to the stagnant mud flat. They're a funny, dopey and irreverent group. The rest of us have always loved these guys, but in fact they were only used in the first season of Saturday Night Live. After doing Saturday Night Live, Jim Henson wanted to develop a group of characters who live in their own world and enlarge the whole idea into a feature-length film. So that's exactly what he did in The Dark Crystal. We'll be looking at these characters and scenic designs next, so when you're ready, turn around and walk over to the case with the swamp model. I always like swamp scenes. The Dark Crystal is a full-length feature film which was released in the United States in December 1982 and then it went worldwide throughout 1983. It was a major creative step for Jim and the Muppets, unlike anything that had come before. 
was done entirely with puppet creatures and contained no human actors at all. The swamp is where Jen and Kira, the hero and heroine, first meet. Kira has become familiar with the swamp, but Jen has never seen anything like it in his life. He knows very little about the world outside his valley, and in this scene, Kira tells him lots of things that will help him in his search for the crystal. They're the only two survivors of a race we call Gelflings, and they're the film's most human characters. Jen, Kira, and the movie's other creatures took five years to develop. The characters and the look of the film were designed by the British illustrator Brian Froud. When Jim Henson first became aware of Brian's work in 1976, he was intrigued. As I said, he'd been thinking about a movie dealing with a magical group of characters who live in a universe of their own. Well, when he saw Brian's work, he felt he had found the right artist to bring it to reality. He approached Brian with the idea, and once Brian saw the Saturday Night Live creatures, he became intrigued too, and the venture was born. You're a boy. Behind you in the corner is the Mystic Tableau. This tableau shows one of the mystics in the Valley of the Stones. He's sand painting, a favorite activity of theirs. Mystics are very good characters. They were responsible for raising Jen. Their costumes are made of all natural materials, which have been layered and quilted. The mystics have four hands, and you need elaborate mechanical controls to operate them. For each mystic, there's a main performer inside, and he or she is assisted by a number of other people, as many as five or six. It's really amazing. One person might just work a character's eyes, for example, while another does a hand, and another would work his mighty walking staff. The number of people operating a character depends on several things. The character's size and scale, the amount of realism tried for, and the degree of detail in the character's movement. This entire gallery is devoted to the Dark Crystal. The movie itself is an epic, a tale of a hero doing battle against the forces of evil and trying to bring goodness and harmony back into the world. His quest is to heal a crack in the crystal, in order to restore peace to the world. Until the crystal is healed, the cruel Skeksis will rule over everyone, including the gentle mystics and the kind, peasant-like pod people. To your right is a case of mystic and pod people props, or artifacts. One of the fun things about the Dark Crystal is that to create props for the movie, we actually felt that we were creating artifacts of an ancient civilization. As you can see, a lot of care and detail went into this movie. Its creators tried to develop a world populated by believable characters. To do this, they developed an entire cosmology, or a world system, for these characters. What they thought and believed in, how they lived, and the things they used in their everyday life. Now let's walk over to the huge tableau across the way. It's called The Banquet Scene, and it shows the Skeksis questioning an old female creature. This old female creature is called Agra. She was captured by the Skeksis when they were trying to get Jen. She's just been brought into their banquet room. Agra does not belong to any race. She's one of a kind. While she's not beautiful to look at, she's one of the movie's good characters. And she befriends Jen and helps him in his quest. The costumes of the Skeksis were made of silks, gauzes, and metallics. They're hard, ornate, and very elaborate. By the way, these are the actual full-size characters used in the film. They're not replicas. That's true of all the Muppets you've seen today. Like the Mystics, it takes several people to perform the Skeksis. Across the gallery, you'll see a model of the Crystal Chamber. The Crystal Chamber is the court of the evil Skeksis, the place where they keep the broken crystal. It's there in the center. As you know, the Skeksis came to power by breaking the crystal, so naturally they don't want it fixed. The crystal itself and the light coming from it give the Skeksis their power. The Skeksis believed a prophecy that their rule would be ended by Gelfling Hand. So the Skeksis had tried to destroy the whole Gelfling race. Only Jen and Kira escaped. Until they met in the swamp, neither one was aware that another Gelfling existed. Just to your right, you'll find the Tableau of the Pod People. They're smaller and simpler to operate than the Mystics. These simple peasants who live in the woods saved Kira from the Skeksis and brought her up since she was a little girl. The pod people's costumes are very detailed. They remind me of some Eastern European folk costumes. Before we finish our tour, please take a look at the case of Skeksis artifacts on the wall on your right. Just beyond this case, you'll see some of Brian Froud's wonderful illustrations. 
On that note, we say goodbye. I hope you've enjoyed seeing old friends and meeting new ones and finding out more about what goes on behind the scenes. At the signal you're about to hear, please turn off your acoustic guide for the last time and place it on the cart as you leave. Goodbye from all of us and thank you for joining me. I checked all the doors. They got us locked in. <laughs>